Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Thank you, Zbinek, for your wonderful work and for inviting me to address the Czech Friends of Israel Association and all of the distinguished delegates of your wonderful conference. Though I cannot be with you in person today, I am happy to give you an update direct from the United Nations European Headquarters, seat of the former League of Nations, as you can see behind me. You know, when I was a student in Jerusalem 18 years ago, I lived on Masaryk Street, named, of course, after your great founding father, who was a special friend of the Jewish people and the Zionist cause. Your gathering this week continues an important tradition. Now, let me share with you what it is that we do at UN Watch, a non-governmental organization based here in Geneva, which monitors the United Nations by the yardstick of its own charter and promotes human rights for all. Let me share with you what it is we're up against and what it is we are doing about it. First, a little history. Seven decades ago, in the aftermath of the Nazi atrocities, Eleanor Roosevelt, the great humanitarian, and René Cassin, the French legal philosopher, assembled for the first meeting of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. The founders had a dream, to reaffirm the principle of human dignity and to guarantee fundamental freedoms for all. But over time, dictatorships hijacked the world body. Sudan, whose leader is wanted for genocide, was a regular member of the Human Rights Commission. In 2003, the murderous regime of Libya's Muammar Gaddafi was elected as chair. Think about it. 1946, Eleanor Roosevelt. 2003, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. This was the final straw. In 2005, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan recognized publicly what we human rights activists said all along, that the world's highest human rights body was plagued with politicization, selectivity, and a credibility deficit. All of which, he said, cast a shadow on the reputation of the UN system as a whole. At Kofi Annan's initiative in 2006, the commission was scrapped and replaced with a new body, the UN Human Rights Council. The reformed body, it was promised, would be composed of members committed to human rights who would address the world's most severe abuses. Ten years later, we ask, is the new body living up to the promises of reform? Well, consider its record in responding to gross violations. In over 50 regular and special sessions, only 14 out of 193 countries have ever been condemned by the new council which is less than what even its discredited predecessor, the Human Rights Commission, had accomplished. Sadly, at the new UN Human Rights Council, the majority of the world's worst abusers continue to enjoy impunity. In Russia, dissidents are harassed, arrested, even assassinated. Vladimir Putin's regime launches bloody wars, invading Ukraine and swallowing Crimea. The council's response, silence. In China, 1.3 billion people are denied freedom of speech, assembly and religion. Tibetans are tortured. The council's response, silence. On the contrary, China was just re-elected to another three-year term on the council. In Saudi Arabia, women are subjugated. Beheadings are at an all-time high. Saudi warplanes have killed 10,000 civilians in Yemen. The council's response, silence. On the contrary, Saudi Arabia too was just re-elected as a council member. And faced with reports of torture in Algeria, forced child labor in Congo, attacks on dissidents in Cuba, abuse of foreign workers in Qatar, incommunicado detention in the United Arab Emirates, the imprisonment of Caracas Mayor Antonio Ledesma and other democracy leaders in Venezuela, and arbitrary arrests in Vietnam. What has the Reformed Council done over its 10 years of existence to protect these victims? Absolutely nothing. On the contrary, the UN elected every single one of these abusers as a Human Rights Council member. Half the members today are dictatorships or non-democracies. That's why victims are ignored and criminals get a free pass. But now consider where the 47-nation body is active. In the 10 years of its existence, the Council adopted 68 resolutions against Israel, three times more than the amount on Syria, where there's a genocide taking place, and seven times more than the resolutions on North Korea, one of the most horrific regimes on the planet. Let's be clear, liberal democracies have their share of blemishes, and Israel is no different. It should be held to account like every other country. 
But when the UN acts so selectively, it fails to demonstrate a genuine concern for human rights. Most UN resolutions that criticize countries include several paragraphs recognizing certain positive aspects. Yet the resolutions condemning Israel are unique. They suppress any countervailing facts that might provide balance. And here's why. Because if something is to be portrayed as evil, nothing good can ever be said of it. Make no mistake, this isn't about a genuine concern for human rights. It's about demonization. That's the sole purpose behind the Council having, at every one of its meetings, a special agenda item targeting Israel. No other country in the world, not Iran, not Syria, not North Korea, is treated under a special agenda item. It gets worse. The Council's commissions of inquiry, like the Goldstone Commission, which excoriated Israel while exonerating Hamas, initiated a new era whereby a terrorist group has come to rely on the Council as an effective international tool to achieve its deadly goals. Hamas is incentivized by the UN to launch rocket attacks against Israeli civilians while placing its own population in harm's way. Finally, consider some of the Council experts. In 2008, they appointed Richard Falk, who promotes the 9-11 conspiracy theory and backs Hamas. Last year, the Council appointed Canadian law professor Michael Link as the special rapporteur on Palestine, whose mandate is to investigate Israel only. While all UN monitors are obliged to be impartial, and though Mr. Link was expressly asked in his application about his objectivity, he failed to disclose his long record of anti-Israel lobbying or his board membership on three pro-Palestinian organizations. Just a few months ago, the Human Rights Council re-elected Jean Ziegler, co-founder of the Muammar Gaddafi Human Rights Prize, an award given to dictators like Fidel Castro and to anti-Semites like Holocaust denier Roger Garaudy. Shamefully, just this past Monday, Mr. Ziegler, who has also praised Hezbollah, was given a prominent position at this month's opening 2017 session. In 2015, the Council made Idris Jazeri a UN human rights expert, even though as Algeria's former ambassador, he led a major campaign to muzzle UN human rights experts. Now, who selects this rogues gallery? Last year, the head of the panel that vets candidates was the representative of Saudi Arabia, Faisal bin Hassan Trad. And so I wonder, if Eleanor Roosevelt and René Cassin were alive today, would the founders of human rights at the United Nations not conclude that their dream has turned into a nightmare? This, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're up against at the UN Human Rights Council. But the world body's pattern and practice of scapegoating Israel has extended much further. The UN today has constructed a vast infrastructure to demonize the Jewish state. Consider what has happened in the past 12 months alone. Last March, the UN Commission on the Status of Women condemned only one country as a violator of women's rights, Israel. At the same time, it ignored real abusers of, wo of women's rights, such as Iran and Saudi Arabia. In May, the World Health Organization singled out Israel as the only violator in the world of, quote, mental, physical, and environmental health. In September, UN expert Dubravka Simonovic, summing up her visit to the Palestinian territories, concluded that when Palestinian men beat their wives, it's Israel's fault. In October, UNESCO neg negated its mandate to protect world heritage by adopting a resolution that used Islamic-only terms for Jerusalem's Temple Mount, the holiest site in Judaism, denying thousands of years of Jewish and Christian heritage, religion and culture. In December, the General Assembly adopted 20 one-sided resolutions against Israel and only six on the rest of the world combined. There was not one resolution on Saudi Arabia, China, Cuba, Venezuela, Turkey, or other serial human rights abusers who all get a free pass. In summary, what we're up against is an organized campaign to delegitimize Israel, to subvert the language and idea of human rights, to demonize the Jewish state. So how do we fight back? Well, 
UN Watch is determined to defend the founding principles of the United Nations Charter and the dream of Eleanor Roosevelt and René Cassin. That's why last month we published a 130-page expose of UNRWA, the UN Relief Agency for Palestinians, which has become a hotbed of anti-Israel extremism. Our report is entitled, quote, Poisoning Palestinian Children, a report on UNRWA teachers' incitement to jihadist terrorism and anti-Semitism. You can find it online at unwatch.org. We documented 40 Facebook pages belonging to UNRWA teachers where one can see their posts celebrating terrorist kidnapping of Israeli teenagers, cheering rockets fired at Israeli civilians, erasing Israel from the map, and posting anti-Semitic videos, caricatures, and statements. When US and European media reported the story, UNRWA spokesman Chris Gunnis went on the defensive, immediately firing off press releases, attacking our organization, UN Watch, accusing us of acting on false premises. Well, we refuse to be intimidated. Soon, we'll publish new versions of the report, focusing on the hundreds of millions of dollars given by the EU, the UK, and even Canada, and we'll urge lawmakers to demand accountability. And in two weeks, when Michael Link the Special Rapporteur on Palestine will be here addressing the UN Human Rights Council. We will be one of the first groups to respond. We will respond to his report and we're going to demand that he resign on, that he resign on account of his undisclosed history of anti-Israel bias. I mentioned Jean Ziegler. Well, when he spoke here on Monday, we managed to register as the first group to respond. I challenged him about his role creating and winning the Muammar Gaddafi Human Rights Prize, and we demanded that he return the $100,000 prize money. Finally, together with 25 NGOs, last week, right here, we held our ninth annual Geneva Summit for Human Rights. While the UN elects dictators, we brought their victims right here. Dissidents from Iran, Russia, China, Turkey, Mauritania, Venezuela, and many other repressive regimes, the victims assembled here at the UN. Political prisoners who were released just last month from Cuba and Vietnam, they were here with us. If you will, what we gathered was the Václav Havels of the world. It was a United Nations of moral heroes, what the real UN should look like. Not surprisingly, one of our coalition partners was Forum 2000 from Prague and also the Czech envoy in Geneva, Ambassador Jan Kara, who made a point of being there. We felt the spirit of Václav Havel was with us. Ladies and gentlemen, the struggle for human rights for the founding principles of the UN is the same battle against anti-Israeli bigotry. It's very much an uphill battle, but we refuse to give up. Thank you, and I wish you a wonderful conference.